Ladies and gentlemen, may I say how delighted we are to have with us today Mr. Philip Wallen, the Order of Australia, and Mrs. Trix Wallen, General and Mrs. Chengapa. <laughs> General and Mrs. Chengapa, Bellepa and Nicole, Colonel and Mrs. Baba Karyapa, Mr. and Mrs. Vijay Krishna, and other members of the General's family, Principal Colonel John Ellis, Brigadier R.M. Mittal, our patrons, Air Marshal Wallen, General Jetley, Mrs. Kiran Jetley, the girls' school principal, Mrs. Princess Frank, uh, Franklin, Admiral Dawson, former principals of the boys' school, Mr. Balraj and Dr. Francis Samuel, Dr. Mrs. Samuel, two of our previous speakers, Mr. C.V. Ranganathan and Colonel Lalit Rai, and the third, Mr. Nandan Nilakani, of course, promised to join us. I expect him to be here any moment. Mrs. Ranganathan, Mrs. Sanjana Rai, Mr. M.G. Mutana, Mrs. Sagari Mutana, Mr. Mike Watsa, Mrs. Watsa, serving and retired officers of all three wings of the armed forces, eminent guests, former and present teachers and masters of both schools, old boys across the batches, old girls, friends of Phil, friends of Cottons, present Cottonians, boys and girls. Ladies and gentlemen, we are truly electrified by your presence here today. Thank you for being here. The legacy of General Thimaya and the goodwill of our former speakers and our present speaker has also brought us a surfeit of messages across the world, which are far too many to read. We acknowledge the messages from the chiefs of the Army staff and the Air staff in particular. Some friends have wistfully wondered if things would have been any different with General Thimaya at the helm of affairs in the present state of affairs that faces the nation. Ladies and gentlemen, as you're aware, the General Thimaya Lecture Series seeks to pay tribute to General K.S. Thimaya and to the armed forces at large, to recognize the achievements of the alumni of Bishop Cotton, to create an interface between the military and civilian diaspora, and to provide a platform for intellectual stimulation and discussion of a topic that is of larger relevance. Of course, the tipple that usually follows the lectures is also a reasonable motivation for all of us. General Thimaya's is an extraordinary life. As he seemingly presides over us today, we feel humbled and privileged to be able to pay our tribute to the great man. The General's was a life that was multifaceted, versatile, and ubiquitous. And he was a soldier first and then a general, as he demonstrated by earning a DSO, which is the highest gallantry award in the British Empire after the Victoria Cross. Timmy, as he was fondly known to his friends, was equally a statesman, a leader, a diplomat, as Rangi described him in the course of his second General Thimaya lecture, an exemplary Indian and significantly for us, a Cotonian. Reading uh, General Inder Gill's biography, one learns that Lieutenant Colonel uh, Gill, as he then was in 1957, had annoyed his commanding officer by not only refusing to cut grass for sale, as he saw it as unsoldierly, but also cheekily asking his CO for an audit of the grass sales. Now, ultimately, when the CO expressed doubts about the attitude and suitability of Colonel Gill to be sent as the commander of the peacekeeping troops to Gaza, and the military secretary put up the file before General Timaya, who was then chief of staff, General Timaya immediately overruled any such uh, sort of limitations or reservations about his caliber, recognizing Colonel Gill's leadership and his spirit of adventure, and particularly his sense of humor, which the general also had in great abundance, overruled the objection and confirmed his appointment as a colonel to command a para troop in Gaza. It is fair to accompli that General Gill not only had a successful stint in Gaza as a paratrooper, was a military cross winner, but ultimately went on to be the director general of military operations during the 1971 conflict. And the point that I'm trying to emphasize is that no account of military history is complete without references, weighty references at that to General Timaya. And what is most significant to me, from whatever little that I've understood of his life, is that he has touched the lives of many, and the lives of ordinary humans, as well as the lives of those who have be become commanders of the Indian Army and achieved great eminence. May I dare say that he is like a large banyan tree under whom many have taken shelter. But unlike a banyan tree under which nothing grows, General Timaya has certainly seen to it that many a spectacular life has blossomed under his patronage. And indeed, ladies and gentlemen, the general would have been delighted with today's subject of Ahimsa, 
and so also the theme of ethics. Those who knew him will endorse my saying that not only was the general a prolific and a fearless warrior, but he was also a man of peace. As he brilliantly demonstrated in his capacity as the head of the UN peacekeeping mission in Cyprus, and so also in the peaceful repatriation of Chinese and North Korean prisoners after the Korean War in 1953, Colonel Lalit reminded us last year that no soldier thirsts after war, but merely obediently follows the dictates of the civilian leadership. And therefore, the theme of peace is as relevant to the armed forces as any other message. Ladies and gentlemen, in, this, in these times of reckoning that face our nation, today we are glad that under the banner of the General Timaya Memorial Lectures, we are not only able to celebrate the armed forces and the spirit of cottons, but also emphasize the fact that these forces do us proud on a regular basis, certainly most recently in Mumbai. And I think ironically and significantly to discuss and bring to you the message of peace, a message that is becoming increasingly relevant in our times today. On this note, may I please request Colonel John Ellis, the principal of Bishop Cotton Boys, to deliver his welcome address. Next extrosum, next sinistrosum. Good morning, friends, and I thank Mr. Aditya Sondi for having given me the most difficult task of the morning of welcoming a hall of this magnitude. Nevertheless, it's my proud privilege to stand here as the fourth Indian principal and 24th in the line to welcome this August House into this beautiful auditorium which today symbolizes cotton at its best. I know much to the charging of the third level enthusiast who will not agree with me. So we are gathered here to come together and celebrate the spirit called cotton. We have organized the fourth General Timaya Memorial Lecture and this is the third consecutive lecture that is being held in this lovely auditorium. And we are here to celebrate what cotton is all about. So I really, with a big heart, welcome each one of you. And there's a chain if you see it. This year we have the girls' school also there with us. So it's a big change from the audience that we had and the audience we have for the folk. Let's give a big hand to the all the youngsters who are there. So today as we gather to give our veneration to this great institution, we take it in the form of an old Cotonian, Mr. Philip Warren, OAM, who will be leading us. And he has very aptly selected the topic, Peace, Ethics, Okun Reza, and India's Gift of Ahimsa. It is so easily and jokingly been mentioned time and again that India's gift to the world is Ahimsa. And we have been so zealous about it that we have forgotten to keep a little of it for us. Today, gentlemen, the society is going through a transformation. These young words of ours, their minds and spirit has been raptured because of the aggression, the violence that abounds in society. And today it is our duty as elders, as teachers, to instill in them the correct values that this institution stands for. It is our duty. So it is very de-defining and de-deeming that we all work together for that through this beautiful 
address that Mr. Wallen would be addressing to us. So I welcome each one of you. And I hope that you would enjoy your stay of the hour that is there with you in this lovely institution. As a small gesture, I would like to the boys to present and show their appreciation for all the leaders who are there today, for all that they mean to us and all that they are leading us into. So may I request the boys to present the bouquet to our chief speaker, an old boy, Mr. Philip Wallen and Mrs. Philip Wallen. May I request you receive a bouquet from the boys. May I request Brigadier Aram Mittal to receive a bouquet. He's going to give us the introduction to the May I request uh, Mr. and Mrs. Mike Watsa, Chairman of the OCA, to receive a bouquet for the boys, for all that they mean to us. Thank you, Mrs. Watsa. May I request Major General and Mrs. Chengapa to receive a bouquet from the boys. And may I request Air Marshal Wallen to receive a bouquet as a patron of this. <laughs> and may I request General and Mr. Jetri to rec receive a bouquet for the boys for their visit to the school. And may I request my friend, philosopher, and guide, Mrs. Princess Franklin, the principal of the girls' school, to receive a bouquet from the boys for having her the girls' school. Thank you. Thank you, friends, and a big welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Lewis, for your message and for your generosity. Uh, we are fortunate to have with us today Brigadier Adam Mittal, Sena Medal, the Commandant of the MEG and Center, the Regiment of the Most Eminent Madras Sappers. May I request you, Brigadier, to kindly make your introductory remarks. Mr. Philip Waller the Chief Speaker of today's keynote address, Mrs. Wallen, distinguished guests and the students. I've been asked to speak about General K.S. Dhamaya and I must confess that I am not the right candidate to speak about such towering personality, especially so when he was busy, he was thick in so many things post uh, partition. I was not even born. Anyway, but I was, I'll make an attempt. I'm a good soldier. I have soldier's responsibility given to me. I take it as a proud privilege and honor for me to speak a few words on General A.S. Thimaya. Before I say something, I must again confess this awful, awesome gathering you have here. The power of Kutanians I am feeling. At the outset, I must compliment the Old Boys Association of Kutanians to have taken the initiative and organized this kind of memorial lectures. This certainly brings us 
now forces closer to the civilians. Otherwise, generally you know, we remain in barracks and we are more or so isolated with you. Coming to General K. S. Thimaya. He has many qualities. I'll just speak on one quality. This is a vision. A leader must have vision. And synonymous with this is a courage. If you have vision and you are convinced, then you have the courage to implement it. And Jan K. S. Thimaya was one military leader which we are proud to have post-partition. You must know, 1947, we had very few Indian officers in the British Indian Army. If I am right, my seniors here may watch for it. I think the highest ranking officer we had, the brigadiers, few of them. Then K. S. Kamaya was one of them. 1947, two-third of army was given to India, one-third went to Pakistan. We had tremendous problem sharing the equipment, weapons, training establishments, dismantling the battalions. The Britishers had mixed battalions. Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, Maratha, Raisan, all mixed in battalions. Because they feared of mutiny. So at that time, we were fortunate we had John Thimaya. Quickly, the forces were divided, distributed, transported, equipment was shared. On the heel of it, we had the partition. I will not talk much about it. We had the massive migration, I think the largest in the world, with the 10 million people moved and they moved with lots of pain. At that moment of time, John Thimaya brought forward his vision and the courage. British, they convinced, almost they convinced our civil leadership that Indian armed forces don't have the leadership. So you have to have British officers here for at least 15 years before you Indianize the Indian Army. John K. S. Thimaya didn't agree with that. He managed to convince our Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, Defence Minister, this better that we Indianize the Army as soon as possible. Within three to four years, the Indian Army was completely Indianized. Whereas on the Pakistan side, it was not done so. When, of course, because Indianization, with all brigadiers were moved up very fast, became a general, and finally he reached the pinnacle of Indian Armed Forces, the Chief Army Staff, in 1957. These ten years, post-1947 were the most important for the Indian Army. The foundation was laid all because of vision of this one man. Having vision is the most difficult aspect of any leader because vision cannot give you immediate results. And sometimes the results cannot be seen in your lifetime. It is very difficult to have a vision and get it implemented. I will just give you a couple of examples of his vision because of which we are reaping the benefit today. <coughs> the moment he took the charge, there was a cry from most of the officers and men to Indianize everything and shun away whatever is British. It was not British, it was not Indian. But he realized the reality cannot be denied. The British have been here for two centuries and they built this Indian army. 
the customs traditions cannot be changed. Till today, we are following most of the traditions and customs, at least up to the battalion level. In fact, Britishers thought otherwise. Many happened to meet them around 57, 10 years hence. Some more acquaintances, generals asked him, have you started wearing dhoti in the mess? Have you sold your silver? All these kind of questions. Are you still wearing mesquite for dinner? So, he ensured that those traditions are kept and followed. And ladies and gentlemen, still they are being followed. Second, as I brought out earlier, the Indian Army battalions were mixed because the British had the fear of mutiny. He realized the men perform better when they are from same reason, same religion, same group. And also it puts, it puts some pressure on the officers when the people are from one caste, one region, they think twice before expanding the men during war. So this kind of change also took place in this time and today we have one class battalions. We name them as Jat, Rajrath, Maratha and so on. Similarly, he had one more, this British legacy of keeping the Indian Army aloof from politics. He ensured, he realized that the armies are instrument of state, not arbiter of the state policy. And you have two examples, the Indian Army on one side and the Pakistan Army on the other side. You can draw your own conclusion where the both countries stands. This is the vision of that great man. There are so many things I can talk on, but I just would like to read one paragraph which I read from one of the books. It said about him, perhaps the most remarkable contribution made by Thimaya and his men was the effectiveness with which they adapted to great change. The Obama had come in 1957. Until 1947, they were really mercenaries. They were hired and trained to follow officers of a foreign country whose national objectives they were to help achieve even when those objectives were against India. Since 1947, they have become patriots. One incident, one of the general from Britain Army, Highlander Army, they requested him to send Leopard first. Well, oh, that's the attire of the Highlander band. He managed to send some. And the Queen asked the colonel of the regiment, that from where did you get this? And she was told, it has been sent by an, by an old Indian army man. The general corrected him, not from an old Indian army man, but from a new Indian army man. This gentleman, this was General K. S. Thimaya. Because of the foundation laid by him, the vision to the Indian Army is still here intact and one of the most strongest pillars of this great nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brigadier, for your comments and your thoughts which bring alive another facet of General Timaya, someone who had legitimate popular acceptance in India but was still apolitical as a military leader, which, as you rightly pointed out, sir, makes the world of difference when one compares Indian democracy with her neighbours. Friends, a coffee table book on the MEG and the Madras sappers is on display and sale outside the auditorium in the foyer. And I'm sure you'll find them most interesting. The sale proceeds of the book will go towards the corpus of the MEG, which does much human service. Friends, uh, it isn't easy introducing Philip Wallen. 
Often one is left gasping at his accomplishments and his guts. Phil, I hope you know how proud Cottons is of you, how proud Cottonians are of you, and how charged up we feel to be associated with you and the work that you do. However, to formally introduce Philip Wallen, we have a classmate of his from school, a friend who from time to time met him in the boxing ring. We learned that Phil was a very gifted boxer in school. Perhaps this is before the idea of Ahimsa occurred to him. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a brilliant and inspirational theatre actor, one who needs no introduction, I'm delighted to call on stage Ashok Mandana. Ladies and gentlemen, and that includes all you wonderful people from Bishop Gordon's Boys and Girls School. Uh, when an Australian and an Indian meet these days to either discuss or play cricket, there's bound to be some sledging. Uh, Philip Wallen and I both enjoy cricket. However, I will try and keep my conversation clean. <laughs> Philip Wallen and I, and I left Bishop Cottons about 40 years ago. It took about as long to meet again. Bishop Gardens can sometimes surprise you 30 or 40 years after you leave it. For instance, this is the first time I visited this auditorium. I must confess I have an affection for the old school hall and the stage, and not merely because I started my theatre career there. For those of you who don't know what Cottons was like in those days, I'm sure a lot of you sitting over here will know that. I'm going to tell you one or two personal stories. I was for a while a boarder at this school. The matron who was in charge of our dormitory used to stand in the doorway of a communal bath. About six or seven of us boys bathed together. She stood there with a bamboo cane in her hand. And if we failed to soap any portion of our anatomy, she would point at it or poke it with the cane and say, here, yeah, put some soap on that man. Boys being boys, we were smart and canny enough to present only our backsides to this excellent disciplinarian. <laughs> Speaking of discipline, there was another discipline practiced in the school. It was called boxing, as I think Aditya has told you. For those of us idiots who signed up for it, I mean, we were in the fifth or sixth standard. We were quite naive. I think ignorant. I think somewhere in our collective consciousness there was the feeling or the hope that boxing had something to do with carpentry. <laughs> the sight of grown boys from the 10th and 11th standards, I mean they put up a ring on the old school hall on the stage with a red and a blue corner. The sight of grown boys banging the hell out of each other made us wonder what had convinced us to sign up for this insane sport. Inevitably, of course, it became our turn to step into that ring with an opponent not of our choice. One of my opponents was Philip Wallen, naturally. Since Philip and I are both from Pope House, I am not going to tell you the result of that contest. But young Tali, our boxing instructor, taught me a neat trick. He told me, I think young Tali was from Thailand or something. He told me, you get close to opponent. I said, no, 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 I'll jab from a distance. <laughs> he said, no, 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 you know worry big boys. You get close to opponent and you go for uppercut like this with bent arm. If you miss with gloves, you get with elbow. <laughs> now this was being taught to us in Bishop Gardens. Where wonderful people like our principal I.L. Thomas and Elsie White were teaching us the school motto on straight on, true straight and true, neither sinus, neither dex, etc. Young Tali, God bless his soul, was also preparing us for that big bad world out there. I have no doubt he taught Philip the same lesson because today Philip tackles people in that big bad world out there. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it is always nice to welcome an old schoolmate back to India. But when he also happens to be an international anti-social element for a good cause, naturally, then it becomes a genuine pleasure. If anyone did more to nearly rupture diplomatic ties between Japan and Australia, I have yet to hear of it. Philip Schiff, the Sea Shepherd, has dogged Japanese whalers in the Antarctic as much as it has been to Canada to prevent seal pups from being clubbed to death. Ladies and gentlemen, I live next door to a game sanctuary in Agarhole when I don't live in Bangalore. I have had panthers, tigers, elephants, even bear on occasion visit my home. During my grandfather's days, a panther chasing one of the family dogs for its evening meal ran into the dining room and found an entire family sitting to dinner. My grandfather had five sons and two daughters. That is not a small family sitting to dinner. The panther turned tail and fled. <laughs> Yet, in the last five to ten years, I have seen one tiger and no panthers. It is the absence of sightings that convinces me, whatever the forest department may try to tell me, to the contrary, that a species is slowly being wiped out. This is on a domestic scale. Philip Wallen tackles this on an international scale. Ladies and gentlemen, when I was, as I said earlier, Bishop Gardens can surprise you about 30 or 40 years after you leave it. When I was seven or eight years old, I lived for a short while. This story has nothing to do with Philip, but it is related. I lived for a short while in an area of Darwar called Saraswatpur. I was not to know it then, but three other people shared the neighborhood with me, whom I would get to know or know of in the future. Mr. Girish Karnad, Mr. Nandan Nilakani, and a gentleman called Bharat Mudreddi. Three of the four of us came to study in Bishop Gardens. About two years ago, Girish Karnad called me and asked me if I would act in a serial he was shooting in Darwar. I said yes, and I went to see, hoping I could still see my home then. Not only did I find it preserved, but we actually shot in Saraswatpur, both, both at Girish's house as well as the house of Bharat Mudredi. Bharat came out of his home, took one look at me sitting on his lawn and said, Ashok, don't you remember me? I was your classmate from Cottons. I didn't. It was Bharat who pointed out to me something I learned 40 or 45 years after I left Saraswatpur, that the four of us had shared that neighborhood at one time, similarly with Philip Wallen. Aditya Sondi got us together, in touch with each other, and since then we've been in touch, and I am so grateful to Aditya for it. I'm rather proud of Philip Wallen. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read you a little bit of his biodata. Philip was a Cotonian from 55 to 67. He was a senior prefect, a state silver and bronze medalist in the state school's athletic championship. He matriculated in Australia where he was deputy head prefect, school valedictorian, and set an athletics record that still stands 40 years later. He is a keen tennis player, runner, skydiver, and golfer, playing off a single figure handicap within 12 months of taking up the game. He was an official at the Tiger Woods versus Greg Norman match at the President's Cup. He studied economics, accounting, applied finance and law at Adelaide University and Melbourne University Law School. He lectured in corporate finance around the world. Age 34, he was vice president of Citibank in Melbourne, Sydney, Manila, Singapore, Bangkok, London, New York and Los Angeles. He specialized in corporate finance and was rated in the top 40 executives in Australia. His Cotonian roots run deep. His father, mother, uncles, one of them is here, granduncle and aunts were Cotonians. He named his first company the Bishop Cotton's Investment Trust. His, letter, his investment bank is Chapel Chase Corporation. His property investment company is the Pope House Investment Trust. And his letterhead reads, Nec dextrosum, nec sinistrosum. Today, he privately supports 350 humanitarian projects for children. And 
animals and the environment in 40 countries, schools, shelters, sanctuaries, orphanages, clinics, ambulances, biogas plants and hospitals. One project, Kindness House in Melbourne, is 40,000 square feet and has 300 highly qualified young people doing incredible things for children, animals, refugees and the environment. He is the patron and sits on the International Advis Advisory Board of many NGOs around the world. He will not be showing film footage of his work today. When he did so in the past, many in the audience suffered emotional breakdowns. His book, Tell Me and Tell Me the Truth, was written for Nelson Mandela and presented to heads of government, Nobel Prize winners, and leaders of all the major faiths. Philip likes to be invisible. I'm astonished to see him here. The Governor General announcement reads, essentially a private man, Philip seeks no personal publicity, but he is not afraid to step out into the limelight for a just cause. Rupert Murdoch's press described him as reclusive. The Australian writer Claudette Vaughan wrote in Man and His Vision, some people would nominate Nelson Mandela as the most outstanding person alive. My vote would go to Philip Wallen. Cry Journal, written in Russian by the Leo Tolstoy Center of Ethics, depicting the top 100 vegetarians in world history. Amongst depictions of Aristotle, Buddha, Plato, St. Francis of Assisi, Rabindranath Tagore, Mahatma Gandhi, Einstein, Leo Tolstoy, Pythagoras, Voltaire, Bernard Shaw, Albert Schweitzer, and Leonardo da Vinci was a picture of Philip Wallen. In 2005, he received the Order of Australia. In 2006, he received the Australian Humanitarian of the Year. In 2007, on Australia Day, he received the award Australian of the Year, Victoria. Ladies and gentlemen, I did say I was proud of Philip Wallen. I'm equally proud of the fact that he's continued to remain in touch with someone he spent three rounds in the boxing ring with more than 40 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Philip Waller. Thank you, Ashok, for those very kind and generous words. For once in my life, I am gobsmacked. Colonel Ellis, Brigadier Mittal, respected members of the General Tamaya family, distinguished members of our armed forces, past and present Catonians, honored guests have come from so far away, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, I must congratulate and thank Admiral Chekhova, Lieutenant General Jetley, Air Marshal Wallen, Aditya Sandhi and his terrific team of OCs, for honoring the truly great man, General Timaya. I am deeply humbled to be with you today, and I salute you all. My topic is peace, ethics, Occam's razor, and India's gift of Ahimsa. But firstly, like General Mittal, I have a confession too. Most of our projects are uncontroversial, but despite my best efforts, I am not always a pacifist. I try to be nonviolent, but we deliberately go into harm's way. Our young volunteers are the Jawans of the oceans. We may be prepared to turn the other cheek, but we will never turn our backs on the powerless. We have never hurt a single person and our ships are 100% vegan. And despite our peaceful nature, our crew has been shot at by the Russian Navy, beaten up by the Canadian Mounties and Coast Guards. Our ship's captain was shot in the heart by a Japanese sniper in Antarctica. Stun grenades were fired onto our decks. Our crew was kidnapped while boarding a ship on the high seas to deliver orders from the Australian High Court. So, supported by international law, we have already sunk half the Norwegian whaling ships 
and half the Icelandic whaling fleet. Last year, our ships rammed the Japanese whaling fleet in Antarctica, and they ran 4,000 nautical miles without killing a single whale. On the ship's bridge, we have a religious icon given to us by the Dalai Lama, Hare Griva, the spirit of compassionate rage. On the bridge, on the ship, is a brass plate which bears my name. I think you will soon understand what it means to me. Forty years ago, behind the school chapel was a small jungle. And as a boy, I was fascinated by the complex spider webs and the small creatures that lived there. I would gently touch each strand and try to predict how the shape of the web would change. Touch one strand and the web changed forever. And it always changed in unpredictable and non-linear ways. I called it my enchanted web. And it taught me that in life, everything is connected to everything. We are all interdependent. At Cotton's, I did a lot of thinking. Unfortunately, in Mr. Singh's physics class, I will think about the periodic table in chemistry. In Mr. Carapete's chemistry class, I will think about differential calculus. In Washer White's maths class, I will think about Keats, Shelley, and Wordsworth. And in Reverend Thomas's scripture class, I will think about girls. <laughs> I enjoyed scripture very much. <laughs> Cottons gave me confidence, and India gives me hope. Many years ago, I wrote to a friend in the United Nations in Geneva. India is a clever country. They understand that in diversity, there is strength. Muslim president, Sikh prime minister, opposition leader is a Hindu, the Congress party leader is Italian and a woman. A cricket team of Hindus, Christians, Sikhs, Muslims, coached by an Australian vegan. India is the United Nations with better grammar. Needless to say, my letter brought much amusement and joy in the United Nations, and they circulated it far and wide. And I must say now that I should officially and formally say I forgive India for beating Australia in the cricket. <laughs> Just don't make it a habit. <laughs> The Icelanders have a wonderful story of Skidbladna, a mythical ship. And apart from its gigantic size, it had two qualities that made it unique. One, when it was it calmed down on the ocean, it could summon up a breeze from any direction to take it wherever it wanted to go. And two, it could be folded up so small and so light, you could carry it in your pocket. Imagine that, a ship that could take you wherever you wanted to go and so small it weighed nothing. That is a profound metaphor for an education. Like the ship, an education weighs nothing, and it can take you wherever you want to go. Bishop Cotton's was my magical ship, and it took me safely on many dangerous voyages. You can take the boy out of Cotton's, but you can't take Cotton's out of the man. Eight years before the school was started, there was a war in India. Historians wrongly call it the Indian Mutiny of 1857. It was no such thing. It was India's first war of independence. Now, the 15th of August is an important date in Indian history. She reclaimed her freedom and did it with nonviolence. Coincidentally, August 15th is also my birthday. I, I was born with freedom, and freedom is our most precious value. And they say that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eden. And Cotton's is described as the Eden of the East. So, 
Will the battle to preserve India's values be fought on the playing fields of cottons? I sincerely hope so. Because our values guide our actions. Our actions shape our habits. Our habits form our character. And our character sets our destiny. It all starts with our values. And I got mine at Cotton's. Where I learned that a man is valued not by how much money he makes, or how much of it he is prepared to give away, particularly to strangers. And in my career, I have learned that we do not find our character on Wall Street because it lives on the road to Damascus. King Lear, late at night on the cliffs, asks the blind Earl of Gloucester, how do you see the world? And the blind man Gloucester replies, I see it feelingly. So do I. They say Americans go to war to learn about geography. I have found a better way. I go where I'm needed, to hungry children, suffering animals, and a dying planet. Like the enchanted web behind the chapel, they are all interlinked. The ancient map makers wrote on the borders of the known world, beyond this point, there be dragons. The dragons are still there. That is where I live. In Africa, 12-year-old boy soldiers kill their neighbors with AK-47 rifles. In China, 7,000 magnificent moon bears, limbs torn off in traps, are imprisoned for 26 years in baby seal pups, are skinned alive on the ice, their tiny hearts still beating. And in my own country, Australia, our animals are sent on death ships to the Middle East where their eyes are stabbed out and their tendons are slashed. Dairy farms everywhere spew poisonous chemicals into the ocean, creating dead zones one million square kilometers, killing plants, coral, and ocean life. The ocean bed today is a moonscape, and the seas a toxic soup of acid. Necklaces of long lines fishing, some of them are 100 kilometers long, now strangled low with 10 billion steel hooks, killing albatrosses, turtles, dolphins, and 90% of our big predators have been wiped out. 90% of our small fish are ground up into pellets to feed to livestock. <coughs> Vegetarian cows are now the world's largest ocean predator. Cows eat more fish than sharks. And we treat the ocean as our private pantry and as our public toilet. The Pacific gyra now is so full of plastic, junk, and human feces, it has created a floating footprint bigger than India. My wife and I walked from the Obroy to the school on just those two streets, and I calculated the amount of rubbish on the streets and the gutters at 750 tons. One day it will all be in the Indian Ocean, killing and poisoning marine ecosystems for a hundred years. The oceans are dying in our time. By 2048, all our fisheries will be dead. The lungs and the arteries of the earth, 2058. Human beings torture and kill two billion animals every week. That's 2,000 million every week. And 30,000 entire species will be wiped out this year because of the actions of one species, ours. And we are now facing the sixth mass extinction in cosmological history, and this time it is entirely man-made. If any other organism did it, we would call it a virus. It is a crime against humanity of unimaginable proportions. You would not believe it unless you saw it. When I show my film footage, in the West in particular, strong men break down in tears and hug their children. I won't show it to you unless you really want me to, but I guarantee you 
you will wake up at night as I do, screaming with nightmares. If we take the oral history of the powerless, their screams would drown out the sound and the fury of the Big Bang. The truth hurts, but it must be told. That is what General Timaya did. That is what Catonians do. We tell the truth, fearlessly and forcefully. That is what the Sanskrit word Satyagraha means, the truth force. Rudyard Kipling wrote of young men dying in World War I. And if they ask you why we died, tell them that our fathers lied. Everyone in this room knows by heart the words of Pettigrew. Shoot straight and true, house of Pettigrew, forward our best endeavor, aim for the right, keep it in sight, soaring our honor never. Or Pope, a grand old house in mind and spirit strong, its cause is good. Or Packham Walsh, you all know this too, making our best endeavor, smiling we fight or fall, and we'll all pull together with nothing untrue or false, and we'll work to the end of our tether. And of course, these words muster on the side of right, march like warriors to the fight. Mark the fall and strike the might. Nick Dick Strawson, Nick Sinny Strawson. Well, I have marked my foes. My cause is good. I will work to the end of my tether. And nothing I say today will be untrue or false. I give you my word. Edmund Burke, the statesman and philosopher, said, for evil to prevail, all it takes is for good men to do nothing. Doing nothing is not an option for Cotonians. I have long admired Count Moltke, the Prussian general, a soldier who preferred to think rather than speak, a real soldier, a man silent in seven languages. But I have traveled a long, long way to be with you here today, to deliver more than just a message. It is a battle cry to arms. It takes courage for me to stand up here today and speak. It also takes courage to sit down and listen. The wise Chinese have a word for it, Zheng Jiao. Listen to the friend who tells you the truth even when it hurts. I am at war. I go to battle unarmed. My only weapons are my words, but words are powerful. The most beautiful word ever written in any language, in any time, in any country, in human history, came from India, from the Upanishads 3,000 years ago. Ahimsa, non-violence to any living being. It is just a word, but words are powerful. Now when the same word has the same sound and the same meaning in many different languages, we call it a cognate word. Okay. For example, the word night has the same sound and the same meaning in English, French, German, Swedish, Russian, Persian, Sanskrit, Portuguese, Italian, Icelandic, and 24 other languages. The word star has the same sound and the same meaning in English, Hindi, Greek, Latin, Swedish, Persian, Kurdish, and 26 other languages. The Hebrew Shalom and the Arabic Salam for peace are also cognates. So why do I tell you this? I heard the screams of my dying father as his body was ravaged by the cancer that killed him. And I realized I'd heard those screams before in the slaughterhouse, on the cattle ships to the Middle East, and a dying mother whale as a harpoon explodes in her brain as she calls out to her calf. Their cries are the cries of my father. And I discovered that cognate words apply not just to human languages. Screams are identical in any language. Human or non-human. When we suffer, 
we suffer as equals and in their capacity to suffer. A dog is a pig, is a bear, is a boy. Words are powerful. But our words have been hijacked. The word Negro comes from the poetic Latin Niger, soon becoming an abusive word, nigger. The word humane has been twinned with slaughter to become humane slaughter. There is no such thing. Genocide has been sanitized into ethnic cleansing. There is nothing cleansing about killing a neighbor's child. The Japanese kill whales they do not need and waters they do not own. For a meat they cannot sell, for a taste they do not like, and they call it research. The sign of the cross, the crucifix, 1,000 years before the birth of Jesus, was used in Asia and Europe to mean do good or good luck. It is now banned in public places because Hitler hijacked it and called it the swastika. We need new words. Victor Hugo said there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time is coming. We need new ideas. The past has not served us well and we are not bound by it. Our past is not our future. There are over one trillion trillion stars and planets in the universe. And on only one of them is their life. <coughs> and it has been the home to every plant, person or animal who has ever lived and everyone we have ever loved. It is what Carl Sagan called our pale blue dot. It is our home. And she is dying while self-important human beings play politics. Arbitrary lines separate nations, religions, and species. Look at the map of 50 countries of Africa and the Middle East, all drawn with meaningless straight lines reflecting colonial pasts, the end of the Ottoman Empire, and the politics of divide and rule. Four-letter words like wall, cage, and kill are examples of another four-letter word, hate. Walls keep cruelty in and kindness out. The walls of Israel, China, Berlin, and Guantanamo. The Gulag archipelagos, Abu Ghraib and Baghdad. And the steel cages of animals everywhere. Dante's Inferno, without Beatrice for his love, nor Virgil for his guide. Where the marketplace of ideas is a fantasy. Where ignorance trumps intelligence. The Orwellian world where good is bad, power is virtue, and kindness is a crime. So our latest initiative is called Kindness Sans Frontiers, Kindness Without Borders. We cross these borders of nations, race, and religion, but we also cross the bloodiest border of all, the border of species, of animals. You see, these arbitrary distinctions and measuring devices are quite useless. If you jump out of a plane, it may be nice to have an altimeter to tell you how high you are, but wouldn't it be better to have a parachute? We only have one planet, one life, one parachute. So my goal is to make India's gift of Ahimsa a truly global phenomenon. Henceforth, I am no longer just Australian, male, Cotonian, I am Ahimsan, a new word and words are powerful. We may be Indian, Australian, American, English or Palestinian. We may be Hindu, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, Sikh, Jain or Jew, or no religion at all. But if we are to live an authentic life, we must share common ground without sacrificing our other beliefs. That beautiful place is our Himsa because it describes our character. It says we oppose violence in everything we do. And the world will see our Himsans as being educated, enlightened, and extraordinarily gifted people. And I'll tell you how.
There are only 13 million Jews in the world, 13. Yet they play a vibrant role in world affairs, politics, arts, psychology, philosophy, you name it. Tibet's population is only 3 million. But who hasn't heard of the plight of the Tibetan under the boot of Beijing? But there are over 600 million vegetarians in the world, and most of them are Indian. That is bigger than the United States, England, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, all put together. If we were one nation, we would be bigger than the 27 nations of the European Union. And despite this massive demographic footprint, we are still drowned out by the raucous, hunting, shooting, killing, bombing cretins who believe that violence is the answer when it should not even be a question. We must name them, shame them, and we will defeat them. Like the noble minds who fought to end slavery, apartheid, honor killings, and the circumcision of girls, who got equal rights for women and Australian Aborigines, we must stop killing and start living. Now, the scientists would know about chaos theory and the butterfly effect. A butterfly flapping her wings in the Amazon jungle affects weather patterns in Africa, typhoons in the South China Seas, hurricanes in Nebraska. Small events have massive, unpredictable, non-linear consequences. Remember my enchanted web behind the chapel. And I ask people, if you fold a piece of paper only 50 times, how thick would it be? And I get varying answers. As thick as a phone book, as high as a fridge, as tall as a block of flats. All of them are wrong. It would reach the sun, 90 million miles, and if you fold it one more time, it would reach all the way back to Earth. So if we double our efforts just a few times, we can change the world. I am not a patient man. Patience is an overrated virtue when lives are at stake. But we live in a world of media sound bites. It reminds me of, H of Hannah Arendt's book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, where she coined the term, the banality of evil. This is how a journalist in the West twisted my innocent words. Mr. Walden, I'm surprised a man of your standing would say that meat is murder, a little old lady with a budget of cars offending God, livestock producers are unethical, there will be no peace until we stop killing animals, industry is unattractive, animals are like human children. Can't you see how offensive that is to our rural audience? Well, this was my diplomatic counterpunch. Well, as a journalist, you've certainly bludgeoned the English language to death, but if you're going to quote me, please do it honestly. I did say, a robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. But that came from William Blake, the poet, in Auguries of Innocence. And by the way, it was the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who said, a sparrow does not fall from the sky without Allah knowing. And I did say, the commandment, thou shalt not kill, applies to the murder of any living being. It was inscribed on the human breast long before it was proclaimed from Mount Sinai. But actually, that was Leo Tolstoy. And I did say the roots of cruelty are not strong, but inhumanity, protected by custom, will succumb to humanity championed by thought. Man is ethical only when all life is sacred to him. But that was Albert Schweitzer, the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. And I did say as long as we kill animals, there will never be peace. It is only a small step to the concentration camps of Hitler and Stalin. There will be no justice as long as man will stand with a knife and destroy those who are weaker than him. But that was Isaac Singer, Nobel Prize winner and a Jew, who knew that the Nazi camps of Dachau, Auschwitz, and Buchenwald were modeled on the animal slaughterhouses of Chicago long before the war even started. And it was Pythagoras who said, it was the blood of animals that first stained our weapons. And yes, I admit, I did have something to say about animals and children. The wolf will lie down with the lamb, the leopard with the young goat, the young lion with the young ones of a herd, and a little child will lead them. 
but that was the prophet Isaiah. And no, I didn't say anything at all about greed and ambition. That wasn't me. That was Jesus. Blame him. He said, Behold the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. King Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. And for good measure, he added, Whatever you do to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So as a journalist, are you suggesting that your rural audience is offended by Nobel Prize winners and the prophets? Or should I just go home and burn my books? I seem to recall that was the strategy favored by Pol Pot. Well, the journalist was speechless, but he did understand I was on solid ground. Epicurus said, if you wish to increase a man's share of happiness, don't increase his possessions, simply decrease his desires. Well, animals have no possessions, they have nothing. And on that basis, they must be the happiest of all God's creatures until we came along. Carl Sagan imagined cosmological time of millions of years compressed into one year. So the Big Bang happens on January 1 and the whole year passes. The sun, the moon and the stars appear as on, on New Year's Eve as the clock starts chiming midnight. Then came the animals. The Johnny-come-lately biped human mammal belatedly shows up at one second of midnight proudly proclaiming that everything that had happened in the past was divinely planned with his special needs in mind. This tortured logic must surely offend our intellect. We need another Galileo to remind us that we are not the center of the universe. And science now explains that we share a common ancestor with a chimpanzee. Let me introduce you to her. She's closer than you think. Imagine we all stand up, extend our hands out to our mothers, and she extends her hand out to her mother. Each of our ancestors linking hands in a chain. By the time this chain reaches Chennai, our ancestors will be holding hands with the ancestor of today's chimpanzee. And that is true of every human being alive today, from the Queen of England down to the humble laborer. We are cousins on the same journey through every civilization. Mahatma Gandhi understood civilizations. On a visit to London, he was asked by a journalist, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? And being a witty man, he replied, my friend, I think that would be a very good idea. <laughs> but things change fast. You know, 15 years ago, the World Wide Web was nothing, zero. Today, it is everything. 1961, John Kennedy announced to the world that they would put a man on the moon within 10 years. NASA wasn't even consulted. Their lunar module had less computer software than I have today in my motor car. But they acted. Eight years later, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. And here's a second punchline. The average age of the flight engineers in the control room in Houston for Apollo 11 was 26 years old. They were boys. That means they were only 18 when Kennedy made this dramatic call for action. Will the present Catonians in the room today be as dynamic as those young people in responding to my call? I sincerely hope so, because the stakes are much higher Believe me, India can profit from Ahimsa. She can product differentiate herself from 185 other countries. India has already won with high technology. Look at Infosys. <coughs> India has already won with low technology. Let me give you an example. Motorola is the most brilliant, successful company, and efficient, if you like, company in the world. Using Six Sigma, they are very proud of the fact that they have only one process error in three million operations. Quite brilliant. Only one company does it better. They have one error in six million transactions. 
and it is Indian. No one knows about it. The Dubwalas in Bombay delivering tiffin to office workers. Great. Well, now it's the time for India to win in middle technology. And that means the biggest industry in the world, the food industry. Believe me, the road ahead for India is not paved with potholes, but with possibilities. Indians rightly admire their entrepreneurs and their cricketers. It is now time for them to honor the Chini Krishnas of the world as well. So I plead with you, I plead with you, <coughs> India must not become the photocopied clone of the West. She must protect her civilized values. Imagine that day when the Indian Prime Minister stands on the floor of the United Nations and announces India, the Ahimsan country where bloodshed is banned. Did you know India is the only country in the world where animal rights is enshrined in the Constitution? And it is said that animal rights is now the greatest social issue since the abolition of slavery. It's about time. At the Commonwealth Games in Melbourne, India put on a closing ceremony called A Taste of India. It was spectacular. 100,000 Australians rose to their feet and cheered. It was on the front page of the newspapers. If this is a taste of India, the Games in Delhi will be a feast. You must have been very, very proud, and rightly so. Shortly afterwards, India was again on the front page of the newspapers around the world, and on the internet, and on YouTube. Barbaric massacre of innocent dogs in Bangalore. My blood ran cold. Newspapers around India carried my article condemning the authorities for their cruelty and for severely damaging India's good name abroad. Isn't it ironic that it was Gandhi who said, a nation is judged by the way she treats her animals. A nation is judged. The philosophers here would have studied Occam's razor, named after the 14th century Jesuit. And basically he said, when presented with a number of possible explanations or solutions, the simplest one is the best. It makes sense. Well, Russia's new vacuum bomb is more powerful than the atomic bomb without the nuclear fallout. They described it as environmentally friendly. <laughs> Occam's razor would ask, is it more friendly than Obama at all? In the West, we waste billions on cruel experiments on animals to cure diseases caused by eating animals. We spend billions to stop cows releasing greenhouse gases so we can eat cows. And methane is 24 to 70 times more potent than CO2. And meat is killing us too in the West. Nearly 70% of Americans are either obese or overweight. So they spend billions on invasive surgery to hack it off. Do you know most Americans wouldn't, wouldn't fit in those seats? And Medicare has bankrupted the United States. I'm going to repeat that. Medicare has bankrupted the United States. They will need $8 trillion invested in Treasury bills just to pay the interest, and they have precisely zero. Or as I would say when I was a young boy at the school, they have la douze. <laughs> Medicare commitments in the United States are greater than the entire accumulated deficit since the formation of the Republic in 1789. They could close down every school, university, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Homeland Security, CIA, Pentagon, FBI, and they still will not have enough money to pay the bill. They would have to grow their economy four times faster than they have ever grown in their entire history and do it for the next 75 consecutive years just to have a chance. It is a mathematical and financial impossibility. That's the United States. Now, if 
that's the United States, imagine India where the numbers are even more dramatic. The leading cardiologist, Dr. Kasliwar, wrote in the Lancet Medical Journal, lifestyle diseases caused by things like diet pose a greater threat to India than HIV AIDS. In two years, India will account for 60% of the world's cardiovascular disease. 60%, that's a terrifying number of the world. And the risk of breast cancer and prostate cancer is three times higher for meat eaters. Even men in the West are now getting breast cancer. The risk of a heart attack in the West is 50%, the same as tossing a coin. For Indian vegetarians, it's a miserly 4%. Zoonotic diseases are spreading from animals to humans. Among them, bird flu, SARS, mad cow, and there are 32 other degrees diseases coming down the pike right at us. And scientists now predict that if factory farming continues, we are facing a pandemic to rival the Black Death, which wiped out half of Europe. As you know, vegetarians have already won hundreds of Olympic gold medals and, and world records. But my favorite is Dave Scott. The, the triathlon um, is the toughest event in the world. Five kilometer ocean swim, 180 kilometers on a bike, followed by 43K marathon, all in one day through the mountains in the heat. Well, my friend Dave Scott has won it six times and 10 times in the top five, and he's a strict vegetarian. You don't have to go far to think of the intellectuals like Einstein, Franklin, Albert Schweitzer, Leo Tolstoy, Sir Isaac Newton, Leonardo da Vinci, etc. What did they know that we don't? They were all strict vegetarians. Oddly, a doctor graduating from med school after seven years in the United States would only have four hours of lectures on nutrition. That's how long it takes me to play a round of golf. Now, would you trust me to teach you how to play golf, knowing that I'd only played one round in my whole life? Of course not. But would you trust me with your life? Harvard University now says that the optimum amount of meat in a real healthy diet is precisely zero. Occam's razor would solve all these problems with three words. Don't eat animals. As Einstein famously said, we can't solve problems using the same thinking that we used in creating them. The great historian Barbara Tuckman studied the major wars of history, and in her book, The March of Folly, she defines folly as acting against our own best interests. Well, the folly of meat threatens our food, water, and border security. Remember, water is the new oil nations will soon be going to war for it. Underground aquifers that took millions of years to fill are now running dry. And it takes 4,000 glasses of precious drinking water to make one glass of milk. It takes 50,000 liters of water to produce a kilo of beef. To produce one cow takes enough water to float a battleship. It is madness. One acre of land can produce 100 kilos of beef and 20,000 kilos of potatoes. In some of my groups around the world, I'm quite terrified. 800 million people right now are hungry. This year, 20 million people will die of malnutrition. Cutting meat by only 10% will feed 100 million people and eliminating meat will end malnutrition forever forever. You know that the U.S. currently imports 300 million pounds of meat a year from South America, where 75 percent of the children under five are malnourished. And food prices are skyrocketing. It used to cost me $197 U.S. a ton for Thai rice for my groups in Asia. It is now 1015 a five-fold increase in five months. Forest depletion now costs three times as much as the recent financial meltdown that has brought the major economies to their knees. And it happens every year. But the meat industry don't give a damn. They don't mind if the car goes into the ditch. 
as long as they get to drive. And the true environmental cost of a hamburger right here is 11,000 rupees. In some of my groups in poor countries, I see them selling their grain to the West while their own children starve in their arms. And the West feeds it to livestock so we can eat a steak. Forests are now being destroyed in right across the Latin America where we are to grow corn to make ethanol in cars. One tank uses enough grain to feed a hungry child for a whole year. When I look into her eyes, do I remain silent? The Native Americans have a saying, we don't inherit the land from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. Every morsel of meat we eat is slapping the tear-stained face of a little child. And this industry is bankrupting us. The United Nations FAO report, Livestock's Long Shadow, shows that greenhouse gas from livestock exceeds those of transport, which includes cars, trucks, buses, trains, planes, ships, the whole lot. Livestock is much worse. Al Gore got the Nobel Prize, but being a cattleman, he forgot that the IPCC, a joint Nobel Prize winner, was chaired by an Indian vegetarian. Dr. Bachauri has roundly condemned the meat industry for being a major culprit. Livestock causes more global warming than all our dirty coal-fired power stations put together. And what concerns me now is that the melting Siberian permafrost is, is really a ticking time bomb. Scientists predict that the Arctic summer ice would disappear in 40 years. Then they said eight years, and now they say two years. The Himalayan ice fields are correctly called the third pole, and they feed, as you know, the Indus, the Brahmaputra, the Ganges, the Irrawaddy, the Mekong, the Yellow River, and they feed half the world's population. And they go into India, Pakistan, China, Bangladesh, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand. What happens when they melt, flood, and stop? Mohammed Yunus won the Nobel Prize for Grameen Bank and microcredit, getting jobs for poor people. If the world does not heed the message I'm trying to send out today, all the good that Grameen Bank and Mohammed has done will vanish when Bangladesh drowns. We freak out in the West when 1,000 refugees arrive on our shores. If greenhouse gas emissions hit 550 parts per million, Greenland and the West Antarctic ice shelf is gone. A three degree temperature increase and photosynthesis is gone. Our crops are gone. Believe me, this calamity will reshape the geopolitical landscape forever. And all the armies in the world will not stop it. Real soldiers do not kill civilians. When I graduated from Cotton, the world's population was three and a half billion, today it's six and a half billion. And when a present Cotonian in the room today delivers the General Timai Memorial Lecture, it'll be 10 billion. And if some scientists are right about the tipping point, we are now facing the perfect storm. If that is true, no present Cotonian in the room today will ever deliver the General Timai Memorial Lecture. Does that not chill your blood? If any nation had developed weapons that would wreak such havoc on the planet, we would launch a preemptive military strike and bomb it back into the Bronze Age. But we can't. It is not a rogue state, it is an industry. And we are their customers. The good news is we don't have to bomb. We can just stop buying it. So George Bush was wrong. The axis of evil doesn't run through Iraq, Iran, or North Korea. It runs through our dining table. The weapons of mass destruction are our knives and forks. The peace map is actually drawn on a menu. And peace is not just the absence of war. It is the presence of justice. 
to destroy a nation, you do not need to bomb its command and control. Just destroy its values. Of all our precious senses of sight, touch, hearing, and smell, the sense of taste is the least important, and for that alone we kill two billion innocents a week, and ourselves and our planet. We share 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees, and laboratories torture millions every day. The Malay word for orangutan actually means the man who lives in the jungle because he's so like us. In their book, Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors, Dryan and Sagan, tell of actual laboratory experiments where monkeys were forced to choose between shocking other monkeys or starving. The monkeys starved. How many people do you know who would do the same? Mahatma Gandhi, my beloved, beloved hero, said of all the black crimes man commits against God and creation, Animal experimentation is the blackest. A notorious animal lab in the West said to me, if you make life too difficult for us, we'll move our operations to South Korea, South Africa, or India. India? Is India to become a sanctuary for barbarism that even the West won't tolerate? I'm rarely surprised by how little people know, but I'm constantly surprised by how little they care biology professor would compare the size of a rat's brain with a human, a chimp, and a dog. And he would say, you see how the brains get larger and the convolutions of the neocortex become more pronounced? And he would offer this as proof of the superior intelligence of humans. Well, the human brain is only 1,300 cc's. The orca brain is 6,000. And the sperm whale is 9,000. And all mammals, from mice to men, have three lobes to the brain. The exceptions are the cetaceans, dolphins and whales. They have four. And the fourth is involved with thinking and communicating. Thinking and communicating. The very qualities we admire most in great minds. And we still slaughter them by the billions. Dostoevsky asks in the Brothers Karamazov, is, all, is the suffering of one child worth all the wealth in the world? And he says, no. Well, what if that child was an ape? For an ethical man, it would make no difference at all. I was attacked in Australian Parliament for being a radical, and they even questioned my patriotism. So I fired back, I am a patriot, but in the, in the mold of Mark Twain, I support my country always, and my government only when it deserves it. During the Cold War, on a midnight train from Brussels to Berlin, I crossed the Iron Curtain. I was only a boy. Armed guards locked the doors and covered the windows and terrified me with their machine guns and their fists. I felt the crushing weight of human evil in dark places. That night on that rail car, I became the terrified animal in the slaughterhouse. I know how she feels. Believe me, your life changes when you face your own murderer. If slaughterhouses had glass walls, no one would ever eat animals again. The smell of death still lingers on the island of Corregidor in the Philippines. Fearing death by general uh, capture by uh, General MacArthur, 5,000 young Japanese soldiers leapt off a cliff committing suicide rather than face Emperor Hirohito in chains. Is it any wonder that in the 20th century, 100 million people have been killed by their own governments? But it seems in most of my audience, there are so many good men and women, and they all want to change the world as long as they don't have to change themselves. And life doesn't work that way. First we change, and the world follows. The meat industry will end like the Soviet Union. We'll wake up one day and it's gone. It must end because it is useless. The Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. The meat industry will end because we run out of excuses.
I often say if people moved on to a pure Indian vegetarian diet, we would be so healthy, we would have to shoot someone just to start a cemetery. <laughs> this is a passion of mine because let's remember in our entire history only 100 billion human beings have ever lived and that's the same number of animals we kill every year. But we live in an age where there are very few great minds like Gandhi or Einstein, Tagore, Wilberforce, Thomas Jefferson, Vivekananda. But the this current zeitgeist won't last forever. Ignorance is not a terminal disease. Peter Niemöller, the priest, philosopher, and a German U-boat captain, spent eight years in prison for condemning German intellectuals for being cowards. And he said, when the Nazis came for the communists, I remained silent. I was not a communist. When they locked up the Democrats, I remained silent. I was not a Democrat. When they came for the trade unionists, I did not speak out. I was not a trade unionist. When they came for the Jews, I remained silent. I was not a Jew. And then they came for me. And there was no one left to speak out. <coughs> Men of integrity must speak out. <clears throat> and we must act courageously. Is it not better to light a candle than to curse the darkness? All the darkness in the world cannot put out the light of a single candle. The last sentence of Scott Fitzgerald's book, The Great Gatsby, reads, So we beat on boats against the tide, borne back ceaselessly into the past. I ask you, are we to live forever in a sick and smug past? Let's not relive history, let's make history. That is what Catonians do. So I call on Colonel Ellis and Bishop Cottons and the OCs and everyone here to at least go vegetarian. It is the least we can do for our nation, our children, ourselves, and our planet. Then we can proudly say to the world, Indians do not bomb hotels. We do not bomb stations. We do not kill animals in slaughterhouses. Indians have good minds, pure hearts, clean hands. And do not be afraid you will be joining a battalion of noble Himaya minds. You are on solid, holy ground. And remember Gandhi's words. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. Gandhi would understand, neck deck strawsome, neck sinistrosum. They are only words, but words are powerful. Ladies and gentlemen, our animal cousins have survived millions of years of evolution. They've earned the right to share this planet in peace. They have waited long enough. The brutes and the bullies have been Goliath, but David is coming. Maybe he is in this room. Maybe he is one of you. And if not you, who? And if not now, when? Thank you. Gobsmacked. We do have time for a few questions or comments. 
uh, we'll pass the hand mic around to you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please do introduce yourself and make a brief comment or pose a brief question to Phil. And we solicit questions from the students. I'm sure you have much to say and much to ask. That's the first. Yeah, we have a question. I don't have a question, but I do share your good views. When I joined the army in 1960, uh, I was a very thin minority. So people ask me, you don't eat meat, you don't drink, then what do you do in life? I mean, I survived all the comments, and I had to share this view after 41 years I am not in minority, Mr. Wallen. I am with you. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, what you mentioned, sir, is a massacre of uh, animal species. Of course, I agree. But if you go back to your uh, specialization, um, early man was a hunter. So there must be a sort of a balance of uh, species. Uh, I don't think that uh, you can totally wipe out the state of, I mean, this uh, lack of the human being of uh, going totally vegetarian. So maybe, you know, there's a massacre should be avoided and maybe a selective uh, uh, this sh should be there. Uh, it can't be a total non-vegetarian or vegetarian in that way. I mean, totally going vegetarian. I what you mean. Uh, man originally was a gatherer, not a hunter. And they survived quite well. Uh, but I do understand that the hunter-gatherer notion is a difficult thing to do. I can see the point entirely. Now we've become so, so sophisticated, factory farming has become a brutality which is no longer sustainable. And I really don't think we need to eat animals anymore. We've become so sophisticated. Certainly, the audience here is enlightened, educated. And we all, my favorite meal used to be um, filet mignon and lobster. I could never, do, I'm profoundly ashamed of myself today that I ever did that. And you're right, it is very difficult to happen. But if it could happen to me, if I could do it, Believe me, anybody could do it. <laughs> I think. Hello? Yeah. Phil, an absolutely brilliant speech. I love that we made it. I think undeniably your passion in the speech was, was uh, both me all my The question I have is. Is your focus towards saving the planet and the result we need to go vegetarian? Or are you proposing vegetarianism to prevent cruelty of animals and as a consequence it also benefits the planet? So I just wanted a little bit of clarity on, on the direction of your speech. And by the way, I Name is Biran, Mulberry Tree, absolutely yellow. You're a little guy. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Just for all of you, uh, Phil was my neighbor. I uh, lived in Richmond Town, not a story. Our house is still there. Oh, I'm just saying that I'm digital to the same. I have so much work for memory. What a memory. Oh, oh, oh great. Oh, great. But my break is gone. I'll wait and have a look at your house last night. You must absolutely be a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, most uh, um, wise and interesting question. I confess, I come to this issue from the cruelty point of view. I've seen a great deal, and that's what brought me into the cause. But since then, I've seen a, a great deal more. I cannot begin to tell you how dire things are. India has got the greatest climate scientists you could possibly imagine. They're excellent, they're top quality. And I read all the Indian... Oops. 
And I read all the Indian newspapers and many others every day. And I'm surprised at how little coverage these guys get in your newspapers. We are in dire straits and something has got to be done very, very quickly. Indeed, um, I, I came to it because of cruelty. But if people stop the man and the killing, for other reasons, environmental or religious or whatever it might be, I'm happy about that too. We've had some successes, for example, in the Middle East. Uh, we're now having vegetarian groups being set up right across the Middle East. Uh, in the Grand Sheikh Al Azhar in uh, Cairo has just issued a fatwa against live animal transport, which is cruel, unheard of. I addressed the Islamic Council of Australia, and it was full of many hundreds of uh, Muslims. And I gave them a very hard hitting speech. And when it was over, the Imam came up to me, embraced me, and whispered in my ear, You give me hope. Well, he gives me hope too. He was coming at it from a Quranic background. So there are signs of hope. And I don't care how we get there, as long as we get there together. Well, um, I'm not entirely convinced by the, this, uh, the moral side of it. It happens in nature. It is, it is nature uh, that one animal leads another and so forth. But what I would like to tell you is, Somebody said something about prostate cancer and eating meat. Well, I have prostate cancer. I have prostate cancer that is spreading. And I am firmly convinced it is because I ate too much meat in my life. That, that is for sure. I still do eat meat, very little of it. Perhaps fish or something. But uh, just another dimension to your thing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, I do wish you well in the rapid and full recovery and permission. Phil? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Phil Olympia, uh, you are an outstanding Catonian, and I am very happy now after getting your talk to be a Catonian, very proud to be a Catonian. And you are a wonderful example for this wonderful audience here, particularly the present Catonians. I recently read your, one of your articles posted on the net and uh, just before bring your attention to one of the sentences there which is still remains with me where you talk about the holocaust never ending for the animals to go to avatar so just tell us a little about that and also do you really believe in the Darwinian theory because I think uh, there is a little confusion about that Two very big questions, I'll try to be brief and I must apologize uh, Last night I actually totally lost my voice, so I was croaking quite a lot there, so please forgive me for that. Um, on the question about the Holocaust, it is the best way to respond is to think about the people who exemplify what I'm saying best. Um, some people think it's insensitive to refer to the Holocaust, but let's always remember that Isaac Singer, the one I refer to, was a Jew. Let's also remember that Singer, Peter Singer, is a Jew. And I always recommend that people read Eternal Treblinka. It's a wonderful book. And Treblinka, as you know, is a German concentration camp for Jews. And it is specifically compared with the slaughterhouse. Um, and so far as the Darwin theory is concerned, I have, um, I grew up in a fairly spiritual environment here in Bangalore. I was I'm probably the most blessed of all human beings. I grew up with Hindus, Muslims, Jains, Jews, um, everybody. And so I developed a sense of the Creator. But in recent times I have indeed been reading guys like Dawkins and Dennett and Christopher Hitchens and quite a, lot, a large number of others. And I am drawn quite strongly uh, to the theory of, of Darwinism. And Darwin wasn't, a, if your question leads in, that it's a survival of the fittest. In fact, it, it's been misinterpreted to a large degree. It's not the survival of the most brutal, 
cooperative nature and altruism abounds in nature. One only has to read it. And now, of course, with the internet, it's so readily available. Um, I hope I've answered the question in, my, in a very general sort of way. Phil, that we should to hear from Bangalore. Uh, currently in India, we are really deprived of uh, polit political leaders with good social responsibility. I think we all agree with that. You are a Catonian by the values, as you mentioned, like an Indian and global at heart. How about you, Frank's moving back to India? <laughs> to lead the leadership for a better India and better world. Thank well, you. It's, it's very kind of you to say that. And, uh, We were here last year, I remember, and one of the gentlemen who ran the wildlife department came to see us and said, do you think you could come and live in Bangalore for a couple of years? We have so much to do together. Um, I, I would think, think very seriously about it. So. I, in fact, I might as well say, in the last three months or so, I discovered during the floods in Orissa, I've been sending money to, to groups that really desperately need money for food, fuel, vehicles, that sort of thing. So piling the money in there with their bank account and their um, SWIFT code. And then to discover they don't have a thing called FCRA and they, would, they couldn't take the money. Of course, you know what I'm like, I went absolutely ballistic. I couldn't do anything about it. But with the help of Avijit here, Apparently, I can be classified as an OCI or something. And if I'm an OCI, I can set up a Ruby account. And yesterday, I did so. So, we don't have any FCIs anymore. So, we go to you, Clementine. Yes. I'll bring up to you, Mr. Scotty. I hope I haven't said anything that will get me into trouble with the central bank or anything. I'm Colonel Kratka. My question, my, it's not a question actually, it's a statement. Once in England, a small boy went to Trafalgar Square and then hung himself. And he had left a note. Please do not waste my body. I have tried my best during my life to change my parents to his parents. They have not agreed. Please hand this to my body to my parents. This is an ironical statement. There is quite a lot in what he said. This is one. Another point of mine is, if all the tigers do not eat meat, if all the human beings do not eat sheep, the whole world will be full of sheep, goats, and all the animals. Where will the human beings live? Did you say that was an ironical question or a serious one? I'll give you an example. Population Australia, 20 million people. I often ask people, what's the population of Australia? Do they say 20 million? Why don't you ask me to tell you the population of what? The population of sheep, of kangaroos, of koalas, of wombats? We're very anthropocentric here. We think it's the human being is the center. Have no fear. If human beings stop eating animals, they won't produce in vast quantities. They will end at a natural balance. And I discovered something when I was traveling around the world. Um, People in other countries eat strange things. For example, um, I, did, I discovered um, there were thousands of animals I didn't eat. I didn't eat tigers, baboons, dogs, cats, bandicoots. I went through the list. So I simply added five more animals to the list. I added meat, beef, present Italians now. Just remember, the world right now is crying out for two things leadership and truth. The moral high ground is vacant at the moment. The 21st century could belong to India. So whatever you do, try to become leaders, aim to become leaders. You know, imagine a team of huskies, you know, a team of huskies pulling a sled. 
always trying to be the lead husky in the pack. Because then you can see the mountains and the rivers and the streams and the views and all the beautiful smells by being a leader. If you're, if you're the, the husky at the back, all you get to see is the other husky's bunny. And you don't want that, do you? So the moral high ground has been vacated, um, thanks to George W. Bush. Um, and uh, there isn't any reason at all why India should take it. I am a general sutra. I would like to get back to the other side. Tell the truth. I think that is what is required most. And our younger people must learn that. I knew your grandmother. We used to discuss across the wall in Corner Road and Emperor Road. And I had dealings with your uncle, Air Marshal Wallen. We discussed projects. He was chairman and chair. I was doing a project. I always found if you tell the truth, however uncomfortable it was at that point in time, and people have shouted at you, down the lane, I found it always gave you peace and the projects were. I think Air Marshal Wallen will bear me out on that. I thank him and I thank your grandmother for some of this message she has given to me in Cornwall Road. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We'll take two more questions from the guests and then move to the students. General Paul and Mr. Sondi after that, please. Well, uh, name you heard. I'm not a Kokronian, but I'm a grandfather of a Kokronian. <laughs> uh, first thing I want to confirm is that whenever you become a vegetarian, your health improves. That's for sure. That's from personal experience. But I just want to ask you one question about this Ahimsa. If great leaders like Buddha, Ashoka, Gandhi, and all of our religious avatars could not spread fully and sustain. How do you visualize today in India and abroad the condition of non-Ahimsa being what it is? How do you visualize that you can really achieve? I think it's a very important question. Step one, I used the example of the Jews and how powerful the vegetarian movement can be with 600 million members. And let's remember, um, vegetarians as a general rule, I'm sorry to have to say this, um, have a higher IQ. They generally speaking are um, earn more money, they're better taxpayers. The amount of vegetarians in prisons is extraordinarily low. They generally speaking make better citizens. Why not? If, if you're unprepared to take someone's life, you're equally unlikely to want to take their car. So those are some general, some general points. In, so, in regard to the, the religious aspects, like Ashoka, for example, you're quite correct. My ambition is basically to try and secularize Ahimsa by all the clothes we wear. We didn't wear it really because I had to wear this, this suit. Um, um, have our himself on our back, and we are highly visible in other countries. Um, I wanted to become secularized so people know exactly what it means. Ten years ago in Australia, if I said our himself, people would say, I've got no idea what, what you're talking about. Now most of them know. Um, and I think it's, um, it's catching. And as, as more and more people in higher positions and more visible people get to know about it, I think it was it was spread. Unfortunately, our time span is very short. We, I hate to say this though, but we don't have a lot of time. 2048, our fisheries are dead. The lungs, arteries of the earth. And uh, I don't want to be alarmist, but we still have a window of opportunity to get things right. And the West has done an extremely bad job. So India and this part of the world must not follow them. Sir, as of today, it is a tearful scenario. Blood <coughs> is cheap and bread so dear. When does your excellency foresee the reverse happening? Finest tribute 
than the sterling Catonians can pay. The general Thimaya is to initiate under your leadership, sir, a non-violent fight against poverty, sickness, and starvation. During your lecture, you mentioned that you have rammed down ships in the Antarctic Ocean. Is it really necessary to ram them down? Granted, docking can't do much with them, but is it still necessary to blow holes in ships and sink them in? I have found that nothing concentrates a man's mind more than the possibility that he might receive a fist in the face. Um, on, the, on the matter of the ships in Antarctica, we haven't sunk anyone in Antarctica. Indeed, their ships are between three and 4,000 tons. Ours range from 650 to 1,200 tons. Um, what we do have at the side of our ship is what they call a can opener. It's a big piece of steel that's pushed out and we ram it and slash it. It's not so much that the damage we do to the Japanese, it's the fact that we've got our own helicopters on board who is piloted by a US Marine, and we fly over the animal planet, and we film it, and it's broadcast in real time around the world. So the Japanese aren't so worried about sinking. The Japanese are more worried about losing face. So they tend to prefer to run 4,000 nautical miles just to get off the TV screen. Now, the, the, the ships that we have sunk, we haven't blown any holes in them. They have actually been uh, in harbor at the time. No one on board, and we found a way to do it. So we have a question from a girl to your left here, please. You know, all the way around. Young Padoshi, who I think is a fantastic. Sorry? Payoshi was a fine debater. Good afternoon, sir. So I've had this question being whispered at me right from the back row to the front row. Um, we have understood the importance of turning vegetarian from your speech, sir, but a question that we all wanted to ask you was, as students, what do we do, sir, actively, socially, about our stray dogs, about the whales, about the birds? Can you give us in any way a, you know, a direction or guide us somehow into doing something every day, not just eating vegetarian, but as to what all of us can do is and actively do about this problem. Oh boy, what a wonderful woman. You will forgive me if I break down in tears. And also another request, I think, from the entire school is that if not today, is it possible for us to see your, your video footage at some other time? Of course. Um, may I just on that point make just a, a suggestion? All you kids are a lot smarter than me. So um, one bit of footage you should watch, if you can, is called Earthlings. Can I repeat that? Watch. You guys up there, you too. It's not just for the girls. <laughs> Earthlings. Watch that. There's another one called Meet Your Meat. Please uh, watch that. The advantage of India, I mean, there are a few people here who flown all the way down from Delhi, uh, from Chennai. There is no shortage of really good groups to join, but please study the subject. And Google is the best thing possible. And to go back to this gentleman's question of how do we spread the idea of Ahimsa, Ahimsa's greatest gift, I hope, will be Google and Wikipedia. Yeah. But uh, I'd be happy to do what, whatever you like, um, but please do watch those videos, get on the internet, um, write as many papers, speak to some of your local groups. Um, maybe one of the groups in Bangalore could write a letter uh, to uh, the principal of Bishop Cotton Girls 
and give them your details. This is going to be the biggest movement since the abolition of slavery. Believe me, believe me, believe me that we have no other choice. And do not rely on the West. I hope that answers the question in some sort of way. Friends, since we're running out of time, we're going to take uh, one question from the girls here, perhaps one from the boys, and then Aziz and uh, do pardon me for cutting you short. <coughs> Uh, good afternoon, sir. My question is to the audience in general. I just want to ask you people, how many of you were actually non-vegetarians when you walked inside this hall uh, in the morning? Just raise your hand. Okay. And how many are going to continue to be non-vegetarians after walking out this hall? Now, sir, I would want you to please convince this pe these people to convert into vegetarians and begin this movement here. Sir, so, I would also like to mention that Kanyani comes from a hardcore non-veg family and before this speech she has actively uh, and consciously converted to vegetarianism and I'd like to applaud her for that. Fantastic. Join and spread the knowledge to everybody else, except Bishop Gordon, girls like Bishop Gordon Boys School. Yes, um, I, I wonder if I could make a suggestion here. Why don't you set up your own organization? You know, your own website, your own people. Make it home grown, there's plenty of information. Get a website, get some stationery, get a name, get, or get a domain name. I'll pay for it. So, start one, call it um, Bishop Cotton's Vegan Vegetarian, or Einstein, or whatever you like. Um, but I'm gratified to hear you ask that question, you made my day. Thank you, sir. We definitely made the change. Thank you. We have one question here at the back. I'm sorry to the boys from the IAC, but when we take one now, we'll give you an opportunity to get that. Good afternoon, sir. This is Ari Das from the Lemon Standard. So, firstly, your speech was really amazing and inspirational. Basically, the points which you touched upon, the basic variety, just showed how well versed and well researched you are in, in the current problems of the world. And the whole uh, the progress of man, it seems more, more of destruction rather than any progress that we are making. So, sir, I would just like to ask you whether you truly believe that what we call as our educated world, can they actually change in time to stop this major uh, wipe out of our own world? Good question. Um, Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of committed individuals can change the world. Indeed, it is only them that have ever done so. Small group, those few young ladies there. When it happens, it'll be them. I could pick it. Young guys here, small groups will change the world. The question of timing is, is a moot point. We are very concerned in Australia because of uh, our proximity to Antarctica, etc. And if global warming does take up, um, take off, we are going to be in pretty bad shape, as indeed will most of um, the countries uh, in Southeast Asia. So time is a real problem and uh, uh, the tipping point I don't think is very far. I would say we've got about 20 or 30 years to, um, to make a radical change and even that's not guaranteed. Uh, this is the last question, uh, Wing Commander Aziz Olema. Right behind you, Aziz. Uh, my question is that all animals in the world are either herbivores or carnivores and they eat a 
body to be there. Man is the only animal which has both incisors as well as molars. So we said that when God made us, the spring we made us, it was meant that we were meant to eat both. Vegetarian as well as non I am certainly convinced up to your talk. I was approximately, I would say, 80% vegetarian now and 20% non veg But now when I walk out of this hall, it's going to be 100%. the reason I am asking you, we have got both incisors as well as molars. We have got both as well as molars. We have got both as well as Thank you. It's certainly true that um, the dental issues are right. We have incisors. However, our plumbing, our internal plumbing, if you like, if I can put it so bluntly, is decidedly unsuited for a meat diet and there are some extraordinarily good articles on this very subject I think if you consult, uh, just go on Google once again or Wikipedia we'll give you even more good reasons why we should get off the, the meat drug but I'm so delighted to hear those words it's, it's made a long journey from Australia worthwhile to hear you say that uh, going to ask for a comment from you in a moment. Uh, perhaps I'm talking a little too loud? No. no. Okay. I just wanted to say that you have an animal rightist, a humanitarian, a philanthropist in front of you who asked a very simple question of me, what leadership quality did General Tamaya have? Well, I want to go back a number of years, 60 years to be precise. I was a youngster in the presence of General Tamaya, and another gentleman was there, a Mr. Krishnamenon who was the defense minister. But I want to tell you that the qualities that we admired most of General Tamaya at that time was his ability to listen to everyone. He was very humble, very, very much alive to what we asked of him, and he would give us answers straight away. I mentioned to Philip that uh, for an example, we talked about Nagas and he said, do you know that in Nagaland we have an insurgency? Yes, we are strict, we are the army, the Indian army is very strict. But there is one thing that we do realize, and that is if a Naga kills another Naga, we don't try and interfere. We let the subject matter be settled amongst themselves, and that is he takes on the responsibility. The village finds him guilty, and then he takes on the responsibility of caring for that family. The way that he spoke gave us a lot of confidence. So I said, here is a man who has a renowned World War II record, and yet he is so humble, so forthright in his answers. But the reason why I'm here is all of you youngsters, girls and boys, I thought you may ask Philip to comment, and I'm going to ask him now to comment on what is the future of this planet. We've got rising cases in Madhya Pradesh, for example, of people dying because they don't have enough to eat. We've got problems with water, 
Philip did mention that there's going to be war over water. There are many people who say that we have just 20 years before everything happens on this planet, plunging us into chaos. Meaning that the older lot, like myself, won't see the end of it because we would go well before that. But the chaos is going to affect you young girls and you young boys. Maybe a comment from Philip on the future of this planet is called for right now. Uh, I don't know if uh, I have put the question to you clearly, Philip. You have. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that gentleman is um, in Marshall, Malcolm Mullen. He's actually my uncle. And um, from the day I was born, when, when he was a young Air Force officer, wherever he was stationed, he would send me money for my birthday on the 15th of August. And my mother would always deposit it in the post office and told me when I was 16 I could have it and buy a bicycle. Well, on my 16th birthday, I did indeed um, draw all the money out that he had kindly given me. But by then I had developed a social conscience at Coffins, and I had befriended some villages in a place called Banragata. So I went down there and I decided I was going to use that money to build them a well. And at 45 feet, we struck sweet water. Today, I don't know how many wells I've sunk around the world, but there would be thousands. We're at 800 to 850 feet and we're sucking mud. One generation. So the young boys who said they're not going to change, well, ch change happens in two ways. Sometimes it's voluntary and sometimes it's not. I suggest um, the wiser option is to study the subject and make a rational decision. And even if you decide you want to continue your current dietary habits or whatever, um, spare a thought in the process for the suffering, tragic soul behind those bars who will never see the sunrise, who suffers 24 hours a day just for us. I'm not, a, I'm not a good man, I'm not a holy man, I'm not a particularly religious man. Oh, I have to just briefly say, five years ago I got married, and um, I've been a bachelor all my life, and at the wedding all my friends were surprised, and it was a big function, and one guy got up and said, Phil, I can't understand you, um, you got all the money in the world, you travel, you've got sport, you've got lots of friends, you've got a great house, you've got everything going for you. Why did you suddenly decide, after all these years, to get married? I wasn't prepared for this question. It got me completely on the back foot. And I just looked across the tricks and I said, you made me want to be a better man. And ultimately, that's my answer to you. Make your decisions in whatever way makes you a better man. Few words fail us, and hence we have to take recourse to gifts and presents. We have a present for you on behalf of the Working Committee. May I request the daughter of General Tamaya, Mrs. Mirai Changapa, to please present you. The daughter. Thank you, Anjali Phil, you will be interested to note that 
amongst other components of this package is a book by Nandan Neelakani, Imagining India, and we're delighted that Nandan was with us a while ago. And another book that may be of interest to you, which is the Kenneth Anderson Omnibus. Kenneth Anderson, a, a most eminent wildlife author and an old boy, someone who filled you personally and we're delighted that we have with us his son, an old Kittonian, Mr. Donald Anderson. Trix, deeply honored to have you with us. Once again, words fail us, so may we present you with a bouquet and a memento, and we'll request Mr. Jagan Muttana to please do us the honors. Thank you for your patience, but do bear with us for a moment longer. We are privileged to have three patrons on this lecture series. Three most eminent old boys, each of whom belong to one of the services. Admiral Vijay Singh Shekhawat, who would have loved to have been with us today, but uh, was constrained on account of a wedding in his family, though he sends us his good wishes. He needs no introduction, a former chief of the Naval Staff, 1950 batch Cotonian, a Veer Chakra from the 1971 operations, and a submarine specialist, and incidentally one of three old boys to have been chief of staff, of course other than General Timaya, and General Sir Frank Simpson who commanded the British Army. Since uh, the Admiral is not with us, I would like to request another old boy who was a colleague of his from the Navy, and incidentally his speechwriter while the Admiral was chief of staff, Commodore Franklin, could I please request you to come forward, sir? Do the honors. I'm delighted to call upon a classmate of the Commodore and the most eminent old boy himself, Mr. Ramesh Ramachandra. The second of our patrons, who Phil just introduced to you, of course, you got the personal side of him, I must tell you a little bit of the official side. M. Ashton Malcolm Wallen, a gallantry award winner from 65 and 71 operations, PVSM and OVSM, and I mentioned in dispatches, commanded the elite 21 squadron, which was a mixed squadron, commanded the Eastern Command, the Western Air Command, went on to be the Deputy Chief of the Air Staff and ultimately after retirement was Chairman of HAL and to me, to me ladies and gentlemen, a personal role model as I'm sure he is to many others. We are deeply honoured to have you on board, sir. And to do the, do the honours, may I request a gallantry award winner, an old boy from the Air Force, Wing Commander Aziz Rahman. for his gallantry during the 1971 operations. Thank you, Aziz. And Aziz tells me he had the honor of flying with Air Marshal Wallen as well. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, the third of our patrons, Lieutenant General S.K. Jaitley, a 1956 batch Elphick House Plutonian, a Sword of Honor winner from the IMA, the Colonel Commandant of the Central India Horse, the Commandant of the NDA, one who has earned himself a Sena Medal for gallantry in the 1971 operations, commanded an armored brigade in Arunanshal and earned gallantry again and ultimately retired as the Deputy Chief of the Army Staff. Sir, greatly honoured to have you with us. To do the honours, may I request, perhaps an equally eminent old boy, Major General Sultan Mahmoud, please. I 
Actually, Jamil has escaped gently. He has been always ahead of me. Right from school days, I used to walk to school. And there was a guy on the bike. He'd overtake me and come to school. <laughs> and from then till today, he even retired much senior to me. <laughs> and outstanding officer, it's an honor for me. Thank you, General Mahmood. Ladies and gentlemen, we are also privileged to have with us Admiral O.S. Dawson. Sadly for us, not an old boy, but the senior most retired officer in Bangalore, a well-wisher, somebody who's gone out of his way to support us. I can vouch for this. He's taken two trips with us to MEG and ASC, and he was in fact volunteering for many more trips. I think we ran out of energy. Uh, Admiral, thank you so much for your support. And to present you with a memento, I take the liberty of requesting a non victorian a proud Sherwoodian, but someone who has also gone out of his way to help us, Ben Marshall Mike McMahon, please. Friends, our mementos, incidentally, I dare say so myself, are quite interesting. Uh, they're coffee mugs with the portrait of General Timaya and the Kumao crest, bordered by the school colors, green and gold, which incidentally happen to be the Kumao regimental colors as well. Thank you, Kiran, for putting this together. Friends, before we conclude, a few thank yous are in order. Phil, gobsmacked. <laughs> thank you from, from uh, all of us. We, we feel inspired, it, it's more power to our elbow, we feel we're doing the right thing and we'll keep doing it on straight on. Colonel Ellis, you're a rock, thank you so much. Your support, your support and generosity to the old boys knows no bounds. And for us it's a second homecoming, thank you sir. Thank you to your staff Colonel for putting this together as well. General and Mrs. Chengapa, a family to us with whose patronage and support we kick-started this lecture series and it's very difficult to express what it means to have the family on board in, in a venture like this. Brigadier Mittal, Commandant, thank you very much sir. We appreciate very much your taking your time out, coming and sharing your thoughts about the General and most significantly supporting us and participating in this venture. As you rightly mentioned, sir, military-civilian relations are something we need to work on. And we feel very, very deeply encouraged to have you with us, sir. Thank you very much. Mrs. Franklin, who had to leave us uh, on account of a contingency, but grateful to her as well. We brought the girls, which is a first for us. I'm sure the boys are delighted. Uh, to her staff for putting this together. To our former speakers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are building this brick by brick. We started with, with Nandan, he was brilliant. We moved on to Mr. Ranganathan and then to Colonel Lalit Rai. And we're so touched that we have ha had all of them with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. All serving and retired officers and guests and non cotonians I want to make this very clear. Many times when I send out an invitation, I get a reply saying, but I'm not an old cotonian Well, friends, thank you for being here. It shows your discretion that you appreciate that this is not a Cardonian venture alone. This is a venture for all of us. It belongs to you as much as it does to us. To the old boys, of course, it's for you. We couldn't do this without you. And please continue to support us in what we do. Um, to the PCs, of course, if the principal orders you, I guess you have no choice. But thank you for being here anyway. And we appreciated your, your questions very much. Um, to my committee members, it's been brilliant working with you guys. CN Kumar, Jairaj Daniel, Rajiv Purnaya, Kiran Lakhani, Rohan Narayan Murthy. A round of applause in order to all of you. <laughs> to all boys who have volunteered to help us out today, far too many to name, but you know who I'm talking about. Thank you so much. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, to each one of you, 
Thank you very much for being here. We feel very proud and very encouraged. And we hope to see you again next year. Jai Hind. Can we please stand for the national anthem?